Good morning. Uh, today I will be reading from John chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Thank you, Esteban. It's great to see all of you this morning. It's a great time to be indoors. It's only 109, so... Uh, at least that's what my phone says. So. But it's a great time to be able to worship God, especially to just put in five new air conditioners. So uh, that's just in order to handle what God throws at us. Uh, happy Father's Day to all of you. And uh, it's a great time just to be able to have some kids here. I got to see some of those. And so that's really great if, if you're able to be here with your dad and and just able to rejoice in that. So that's always a good thing. Lots of good things coming up this week. Uh, looking forward to the popcorn. I mean the movie. Uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll be able to have a great time together. So I hope all of you are coming to that. There's lots of good things going on this week. So I want to talk a little bit about Father's House. And about what that really means. The passage that Esteban has read. Is Jesus talking about a time when he's leaving. And he's trying to comfort his disciples. How do we comfort somebody when we're the ones leaving and we're basically saying, you'll be fine. Uh, that's what he's really trying to do. But he puts it in this kind of a way of being able to tell them about this. And so he tells them he's leaving. And by that, he means his death and resurrection. And so this is supposed to be encouraging to his disciples that he is going to be going and he tells them about his father's house. He says, my father's house is so big. It's got lots of rooms and there's lots of place for you. And I'm going to go and I'm going to make a place for you. And I've always thought this was so interesting. If the rooms are already built and they're already there because the father's house is big, what is he doing? I mean, he's not building on and saying, oh, well, there's another one made it. We'll build a new room. Now the room's already there, the house is big enough, it's got a place for you, and that's what he's trying to get across here, is that God has a place for you that's going to be amazing, it's going to be beautiful, it's going to be wonderful. I'm going first, you're going to come later. And I think he's decorating, right? I mean, we don't all want pink rooms. And so he's going to paint it the right color, put in the right things, make it the best he can be. Uh, I mean, this is going to be an amazing place by the time you get there. And he's telling them, you've watched me live my life as a person of God. And so you know who the Father is. You know all about the Father. You have seen the Father. And Thomas gets a little bit confused at that, and he goes, I haven't seen the Father. What do you mean you're going to the Father? I don't know where the Father is. How would we know the way? And Jesus just looks at him and goes, I am the way. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am the way. And if you've watched what I do, then you know exactly who the Father is. And, and Thomas is still trying to get hold of this whole concept. And Jesus tries to explain here, you know what, if you've seen one person who believes in God, who has this kind of faith in God, you're able to understand something about God. And that's what I really want you to know today. If you see someone who has great faith in God and understands something about God, you get a chance to see a little bit of God. And Jesus says, because I was here and I lived here, and I showed you what faith looks like and what God looks like through me, then you're able to get a chance of what that's like. 
how we develop faith is always so interesting to me. And Jesus tries to say, you know, you've seen this. You've seen God. I've shown you the Father. Because they've watched God give law again, the same as he did on Mount Sinai. And maybe it's not, you know, earth-shattering, quaking, and everything else. And it's just Jesus sitting on a mountaintop saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. But that's God giving his law again. God giving his teaching again, and they've even been part of that. They've seen God raise the dead. They've seen him heal the blind. They've seen him do all kinds of things, but he did every single one of those things in order to produce faith because he didn't always do that. He didn't heal every blind man. He didn't heal every lame man. He didn't feed them every time for lunch. He only, he only gave them lunch twice that we have recorded. He didn't heal every single blind man. He didn't heal every lame man because as he walks through the pool of Siloam, he finds one guy and he says to him, do you want to be healed? Well, there's people everywhere. But he just heals that one. It's also that you can have faith in God. And by having that faith, it changes your life so that you're able to be with him. That's what makes all the difference in this. And so it's a way of teaching or a way of training. And now he comes to that part where he says, and I'm going to be leaving. And that may be the hardest thing. That's really the big test, isn't it? I mean, we can believe as long as somebody else who taught us is there. Somebody else that we know about is there. And we can believe as long as they're there watching and encouraging and lifting up. And then, you know what? When they leave us, it gets a little bit harder, doesn't it? If the guy who trained you, taught you, knows you, then you get away from home or away from them, and it's, it's harder to go anymore because you don't know anybody there. Now it's got to be because you believe, not just because they believe, and that gets tougher to do. We get where we're much more difficult in doing that. That's why when people go away from home for the first time, there's no telling what they're going to do. Why? Haven't they been taught? Haven't they been trained? Haven't they seen how their parents lived? And this is the way you will behave from now on, right? Oh, we all know better because of what we did. And why is that? Because we don't learn what it really means how to live from watching them. And somehow we've got to be able to develop that kind of faith where we can see a person with faith and we are able then to have faith because of them. It's what Jesus says here. He says, I'm going to leave. You're going to be on your own. And they're about to panic. What? You're leaving? We don't know where God is. We don't know the way to God. He says, you've seen me. You've seen the Father. Don't panic. Just do what I've taught you to do. And that is such a, a huge thing. Because it doesn't matter whether he's there or not. Now, it does get harder to believe when it's not visible. But he's taught us how. It's about this concept of total surrender. And that's really what the book is talking about today as we talk about believe and about what all that means, this idea of total surrender. And total surrender is when you really give somebody else control, when you really give God control. I think we let our parents have control for a while and maybe fought against that toward the end. But this is about when we surrender, knowing something will work. Because we believe in what they're doing. We believe something is right. We believe in Jesus. And we believe if we follow him, things will work right. That's the role of fathers today. Fathers is about total surrender. One father is more than a hundred schoolmasters. Because you watch how he does it, and you watch why he does it, and you watch the way he does it, so that you can do it later. And that's really the way it has to work in all of this. A good father means total surrender. It means giving up things for your family. You give up everything but family. It's one goal, to raise your family to be happy. And I don't mean happy for 30 minutes. 
I mean, to raise them so that they are happy all the time. It's not just a happy minute. Train them to always be happy. And that takes time and that takes energy. Uh, it isn't that you have to give up every minute of every day, though. You just have to give up all the time when you wanted to do something else. <laughs> and just as soon as you thought, I'll get a little bit of time in order to do, oh, no, you're needed now. And that's the only time you have to give up is every time that you thought you wanted to do something. So that's just one of those things that happens. Uh, that's really what it's all about, the surrender of self in order to be a father so that your children will learn what it means to surrender themselves so that they can be a father. It's not even expecting total commitment. It's expecting some kind of commitment. Can we find that in our world today? Where people would really understand and believe what's going on. I think we see this in Jesus as we look at his surrender and the things that he was able to do. Hebrews 12, looking back at Jesus and commenting on what's going on with him. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And he's talking about all those people from faith that are mentioned in Hebrews 11. He says, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary and faint-hearted. And that's the reason. He says, I want you to look at Jesus because he's the example of how to do all of this. He's the example of this total surrender because he surrendered everything to God. That's really what he was all about. Certainly, I don't know that Jesus came up and said, guess what? I would love to go die on a cross. No, I think that's probably not going to be the first thing any of us would think of doing, but... Is he willing to? Yeah. That's what we read about is that he's willing to give his life on a cross. And why? Because of who it makes God. It makes him able to reach. It makes him able to do. It makes him able to save. Because without that, you don't have grace. Without that, you've got law of Moses. Everybody better behave. And Jesus said, we need a better way. We need a different way. We need a way where people can believe, not just follow law. And he says, I'll come to earth and I'll show them exactly what it means to live a life that is dedicated to God. To live a life that is full of surrender. And yet Jesus was very much his own man. He very much did all the things that he wanted and taught. And he was able to do things that were just incredible as you look at him. What a guy. I, I mean, he's changing the world because of his surrender. I hope you get the parallel. It's usually not because of our might and force that changes the world. It's more because of what we stand for and because we believe in something. And Jesus did that. He came and he showed us how to do that. And as you look at the passage, it talks about he believes in this plan. He believes that if he died on the cross, you would listen. Because you're not going to read the book. Everybody knows that. Guys don't read the book. We're going to wait for the movie to come out, and then the movie isn't all that good. But maybe if somebody came and showed us what it took, and he was willing to give his own sacrifice. He believed God would raise him up again. That he could be in the absolute worst of conditions and that God would raise him up again. And he really puts himself in those conditions, doesn't he? By serving God, by challenging Pharisees, by challenging the law, by getting them to see and understand who God really is, that it's not just a matter of, of ritual and rote and being able to do things. It's a matter of faith and being able to believe in a God who moves mountains, who parts waters, who does all kinds of things, and that that God really is in our world today. And Jesus comes and he expresses that and he sees that. He's the founder and perfecter of faith. 
He's the one who explains it. He's the one who says, here's what it looks like because he believed that if he went to a cross, God would raise him up and he would be seated at the right hand of God. He would be in that special place. He would be in one of those places around the throne of God. So for the joy set before him, he despised the shame. He endured the cross. And he goes to the right hand of God. For the joy set before him, for the joy of resurrection, for the joy of the completion of grace, for the joy that mercy brings, for the joy that redemption holds, for what it means for God not to fall short so that he couldn't save. It would mean that God so loved the world if Jesus dies on a cross. He makes that verse true. He went through it. He endured it. And all we have to do is follow him. And yet, for some reason, we still find that difficult, don't we? And we don't quite understand. And so Jimmy told a story in class today about his dad and about what happened with him. And so I always stay away from stories about me. However, my wife has encouraged me <laughs> to be able to tell a story about me this time or about our family more than anything else. Because we were talking one day and we said, well, you know, why is it that I don't have any trouble believing and that other people seem to have a terrible time believing? I mean, even when you show them all the stuff, it's that, you know, they find, yeah, I see it all there, but I just don't know that God would ever come through for me. I'm like, well, of course he would. Why would you doubt that? And it just seems like, you know, there's so many people that just really don't get that. And as we've talked about it over quite a few months now, I've come to realize maybe it's where I grew up. And maybe it's a little bit of what I went through because I had a guy of faith who was my father. And I was able to see his faith as he explained God. So here's the story. Sorry, it's a little bit long. So my parents are in college, out of college. I wasn't there. I don't know. At least not yet. <laughs> and my dad wants to go preach somewhere, and he wants to go preach in Africa because that just sounds really cool to say I'm preaching in Africa. And apparently I was somewhere on the way, and the doctor said, no, if you go to Africa, you'll kill the baby. My dad said, okay. No, he didn't really say that. <laughs> so what's the ne next best option? Well, the next best option apparently is Alaska. Because you cannot stay within the continental United States and be considered a person who really has faith in God. So apparently he decides that Ketchikan, Alaska is the place where we're going to be. Now in order to get into Ketchikan, it's a little bit difficult. Uh, the only way in, since it's on an island, the island is Revillagigedo. I'm sure you will all remember that. Uh, but it's just a big island. It's off the coast of British Columbia. Actually, there's you know, parts of Alaska there on the coast, but no one lives there, so what's the point? It's off the coast of British Columbia, the closest in inhabitants, and the only way there is by seaplane or boat. This is a picture of a Grumman Goose seaplane, and this is how you would get off. It holds maybe 10 people. So I just want you to realize where this place is and what this place looks like. So I'm going to give you a few pictures of, of what this looks like. Um, that's the only way in or out. Uh, here is the city, big thriving metropolis. Uh, actually not. It has lots of logging because trees are everywhere. This is the, uh, it's not a tropical rainforest, but it's a rainforest. It rains probably 200 inches a year here, and so trees grow incredibly big. Uh, I've seen it where, you know, 10 guys can't stretch around the tree. Uh, 
it, it's, they're huge. And so that's where the logging takes place. It's also the salmon capital of the world, at least that's their claim. And so there's a tremendous amount of fishing, lots of canning, and my, de my dad decides this is the place where we're going to go. Uh, I was six weeks old when we went there, uh, and we left and uh, arrived in Anchorage the day I turned 12. So this is the first 12 years of my life. We moved there in 1951. I know of you, some of you can't count that far back. It is a long time ago. It is before Alaska became a state. It is that long ago. The reason the pictures are in black and white is they had not invented color photography yet. <laughs> it is that long ago, okay? Just to give you an idea of how far this goes back, you can see the stacks of logs that are there, uh, maybe a little bit at least. Yeah, here's the stacks of logs. These are log rafts that go. And so we really had the guy who would walk out with a big fork on it, and he would, you know, you see the log rolling things that nobody can do. That was their job. They would go out and then they tied those logs together to rafts and floated them down to the pulp mill and they would make pulp and then we would make paper and all that kind of stuff. So we're on this island. It has one road. The road goes 16 miles in one direction and 22 miles in the other and then you turn around. <laughs> so a good Sunday afternoon would, we're going to take a drive. You can drive the whole island in a Sunday afternoon. That's it. You cannot go anywhere else. On top of this, the mountain is very, very steep. And I don't know if you can really tell. Of course, it seemed very steep then. But you can kind of see from this picture, this whole section here is kind of on pilings. And it was that way because it has to be built out over the water. And they have lots of wood. So here's a picture of Creek Street. This is a common way in which they did their houses. I mean, we've got wood. Tides are going to wash away anything else. And so you, you know, you're going up the mountain, but it takes a lot of blasting to get that out. So this is the typical type of place where I grew up. The streets were bored because the mountain is so steep, you cannot cut in enough. The sidewalks were bored because, once again, if the street sloped this much, we're going to build a board sidewalk. They're in a lumber area. We've got lots of wood. So the whole town is, is wood, and that's basically what happens there. I'm just trying to give you an idea of what this is like. Here is a picture of our house. Here is a picture of the church building. They are one in the same so, this is from the outside, obviously. So this bottom section is the church building. This is the door to the church building, otherwise known as my basement. <laughs> this is the high-rise church building. It's a three-story house. So the main place where we live is right here and all the classrooms. And then sleeping quarters are somewhere up in here. Uh, in that little rafter part, and so that would be where bedrooms would be. Um, but that's where we lived because that's the place where the preacher stays. And so my dad said, this is where we're going to be, and, you know, we've got this great place. Um, that's a 1956 Ford, I believe, so not sure when the photography was done, but it's probably around that time. As you begin to look at this, this is our house. This is the outside of what's going on. Uh, you're able to see exactly how this worked. Just to encourage you today, uh, it looks like this at times. Okay? I know you don't realize any place has snow, but this is the place where the snow is. And so you can see it kind of shoveled in, going down to the, where the little sign says Church of Christ right here. And uh, this is the door to get into the Church of Christ. Here's my mom and my sister sitting up on the, looking out the window at all the nice snow. You're not going to see that when you walk out of our building, however. <laughs> the inside, the auditorium, 
looked like this. This is my first church. Uh, it has wooden chairs. Be thankful for padded pews. It has, let me see if I can do this. It has an oil stove right here, which one of the things was my job to go down and light the oil stove so that the building would actually be warm, has tile floor. I mean, it's just a basement. That's all it is. And so I'm trying to put together some pictures here to be able to give you one view of what this whole thing looked like. This is the communion table, which is nothing more than a table with cloth spread over it, somehow left over from the south because flies were everywhere. We didn't have those, but, I mean, that's just the way you do it. Uh, here is the pulpit back here. If you can see this little tiny box, um, that's the pulpit where I delivered my first sermon when I was nine. It lasted all of two terrifying minutes. <laughs> it was one of the hardest things I had ever done. But that's where we were. That's where we worship. That's where... We had a place that was what my dad had taken us to, and I understood very much that this was because we believe in God. And because he believed in God, because he felt like this was important to be there, that's where we were. Um, and I felt like I was helping. I don't know that every kid feels like they know what their parent is doing why their parent is doing, and they are involved in the process of doing it. But I very much felt that because it had been explained to me. This is how we follow God. We are here. We are in this place. We are far away from everybody else. There is no way out. You couldn't get off this island if you had to. But the reason we are here is because of God, and we are here to serve him, and we are here to do his will. And I felt very much a part of that. And so for some way, and I really don't know how, that had been communicated to me, and I felt like I was part of that. Um, we didn't have any money. I can just put it that way. My dad had an electric motor winding shop. It was not like today where preachers are supported at all. My mom worked in an insurance office. We did not have the luxury of a stay-at-home mom. That was just an impossibility for us. And so I was very glad that we were serving God. I was excited about this. At some point toward the end of this time, they had purchased a warehouse. I remember trying to go there and trying to build some things. And then some other things happened. I'm not sure exactly what. All I know is my dad's no longer the preacher here. And there's somebody else coming. And we don't get to stay in the house. And there will be another w place. And they may have sold the house. They may have had the preacher coming in. But hey, I'm 11. I don't remember all the details, but I remember a lot. And so since we had lived in the preacher's house and the church said, you're no longer the preacher here, it meant that we're moving. And so there's not a lot of other places around and certainly not a lot of places that we could afford and so we were going to this little place in the country that sounds quaint it was not no one had lived in this house for several years but it was a place where we could go and we were able to live we still attended the same church even though my dad was not the preacher because we believed in God and we believed what God was doing. I did believe everything would be okay because that's the way I had been raised and that God would provide and even though my dad didn't have a job that everything would work out. And so we went out and saw the new place where we would be moving to. It consisted of two rooms neither of which was a bathroom. It had a front room. It had what would be my parents' bedroom. There was no laundry. There was no hot water heater. There was no water, period. There was no bath. There was no toilet. There was no refrigerator. There was no oven. There was no phone. This is just two rooms. That's it. And I thought it was so great. I mean, this was the most fantastic place ever. 
it was 13 miles out of town, 13 miles away from any other store, gas station, anything else, and it was surrounded by woods. And I could step out my front door and be in the woods. How fantastic can you get? I mean, there is not another better place to live for an 11-year-old boy. I could go for miles and never run out of woods. And I did. We would go out to play, and I still don't know why, but my mom never worried about us. Where are they? Well, I don't know. They're out there somewhere within, you know, three or four miles. <laughs> it's a hard time realizing that, that, you know, that wouldn't be acceptable today. But after all, I was 11. I was grown up. I knew what I was doing in the woods. I wasn't going to be lost. And, you know, you learn your way around. And so this was the most fantastic place. It was great. So in moving 13 miles out of town, you might need a good car. Uh, this is not our car I'm going to show you, but this is the same model as our car. We had a 1939 Chevy Coupe, no back seat. We sat on apple boxes in the back long before the days of seat belts, just because it was way too hard to stand up, crouch down like this. So it's okay, we need something to sit on back here. And that was the only transportation. This was about 1961, so the car's over 20 years old. Uh, and we're 13 miles out of town, 13 miles from the next house with no phone, 13 miles from a gas station, 13 miles from anybody who can help. Now, there were few people along the way that lived out that direction also. So it's not like you're away from all people. You're just away from anybody who's going to help. And so you can't buy anything out there. If, if you forgot milk, it's a long way back to the store. So my dad said about fixing things in order for us to live in this place. The first thing was there was already a bathroom. That was great. There was a two-seater out back that had this nice little boardwalk, and there was a Sears catalog. <laughs> Took me a while to figure out what that catalog was for. I thought, why would they put the catalog in here? Just to look at pictures? And then it finally dawned on me, okay, maybe it's for other things. Be sure you use the non-interesting pages. <laughs> so we needed a place to keep food. My dad had found a steel box. I think it was, you know, I don't know how big it was. Mounted it on the front porch. We very seldom had to put ice in it because it was cold enough. Sometimes things would freeze, but not all that often. This is a fairly mild climate north of Seattle, uh, 200 inches of rain a year, and so there's a lot of rain, but it stays, you know, 30, 40, something like that. It's eh, 50 maybe on a good day, but, but it never really gets that way, and so that was our refrigerator, and so that would keep things cold on the days when it did venture up to 60, we got a black of ice and we would put it in there and so that worked. So we didn't have water and my dad did what I thought was the coolest thing. He went out and he built a box and I can remember him helping him with the box. The box was maybe a little bigger than this. It was about four by six feet as I, you know, my memory's not really that good and everything's bigger than what you, or smaller than what you actually remember. And it was up off the ground and he lined it with visqueen and ran the gutters so that they would go through a filter into this box. Ran a hose from there to the front faucet, put in a pump. We had the best water ever. It was collected off the roof. Whenever you wanted water, you just flip the switch by the sink and you have water. I thought that was great. Nobody else has an electric faucet. I mean, who else is going to have an electric faucet? All we have to do is flip the switch, and sure enough, water comes out, and, and we were good. However, you know, you can't really drink that water, and so drinking water all had to be carried from town. And someone had invented in World War II these great big army cans. I think they had gas in them. They're five gallons apiece, and they're steel, 
and they are heavy. So it was my job to be able to carry the water. I was so glad by seventh grade that I had done that because I actually had a muscle. <laughs> Most other seventh graders did not, so you know it worked out well. <laughs> Laundry was done in town because there was none and it took a long thing for things to dry. Hot water was heated on the stove. There was a wood burning stove which had been converted into an oil burning stove and I don't remember if my dad did that or if it was already done. There was a wash tub that was put in the front room, heated water on the stove, put that in which never really got the water warm and that was a bath. Sleeping space was at a premium in this tiny little place so they had a garage that was made out of nothing but tin. Uh, the garage was away from the house, not even attached. We had huge trees, so Dad went and we cut down these huge trees, tore all the limbs off, stripped all the bark off, pulled them back to where it was, jacked up the garage, set them on top of these logs, and then scooted the whole thing back by the house, cut a door in the side of the house so that we had extra room now. So we had all kinds of place out there. It's just not heated. And it was my bedroom. And so water is heated on the stove. You pour it into an empty mayonnaise jar. You run out really quick and you throw it in the bed and you run back in the house for about 20 minutes. And then you run out and you curl up around the spot where that little jar was and then you go to sleep because you've got all these great big covers on and you know, you've got this nice little warm spot and it's raining and the roof is tin and it just sounds so great. That's why I like rain today. So to give you the perspective, it rained there probably 200 inches a year in Arizona on a good year when it rains a lot, it rains seven. <laughs> okay, so just that's the comparison. But we were okay. Things were good. My dad was figuring out things. I wasn't really worried about it. I was his helper. I had helped with the box for making water. I hauled the water. Uh, it gave me great faith because I believed in the process. We were here serving God, and that's the reason we were here. And if it took this to survive, then I understood what it was all about. But the final blow came when we're not making it because we're just not able to survive on this. Um, I learned later they were severely in debt, and so he has got to find a job somewhere else. Well, there's nowhere else on this island you can find a job. You can imagine there's no place to go. And so that's really the way it is. And so the plan was for him to apply for a job, and he applied for a job outside of Ketchikan and was immediately accepted in civil service in Anchorage. And they tried to put him off till after Christmas and I believe he left the next day. And we would spend six months without him while we finished school. And I was the man of the house. And the plan was for dad to go to Anchorage to get a job, to get a car, to find a place for us to live and I would finish school. We would pack everything up. It's only six months. But it's six months with no phone calls, because you realize we have no phone. It's six months with maybe a letter, and so I would not see him for that amount of time. And that's really what happened. We had been through a lot, we had made it work, and somehow I knew it would be okay. Because my dad had taught me, God does this. God blesses people, and you don't have to worry about it because we don't know how it's going to work. We just know it is going to work. And we sometimes develop this crazy arrogance that things are going to work, which drives my wife crazy. <laughs> and maybe a little bit misplaced. But it's there nonetheless. It's what we believe, even in the face of common sense. So I carried water, I did everything that we could, and we finally got ready. The only thing we could find to put our stuff in was an 8x10 trailer, and so we left most everything behind. We 
pull that onto the ferry, Malaspina. This is a picture of Malaspina. It's no longer functioning, I don't believe. And it took about three days to sail to Haines. And we hadn't heard from him or talked to him in six months. And I got very concerned because all we have on this boat is a trailer. And I can't pull that trailer off. And I haven't talked to my dad in a long time. And I knew he's supposed to get a car and he's supposed to get a house. But does he know about the trailer hitch? Because if he comes with a car, we're still not going to be able to pull the trailer. So it was great concern to me about, you know, how are we going to do this? But when we got there, he finally shows up with a... 1950 Chevy with a trailer hitch. We pulled it off and it takes a while to get up to Anchorage. We finally got to Anchorage and we pull up in front of the most gorgeous place I've ever seen. It was incredible. He had bought a brand new trailer, 10 feet wide, 55 feet long with a pop out and it was the most incredible thing I'd ever seen. My sister and I even had our own bedrooms. We had never had that, ever. It came furnished, all new furniture. We had never had that. And I was so proud of my dad. It had hot and cold running water. It had a washer and dryer. It had a refrigerator. It had something called central heating. <laughs> we had never had that. The living room actually had wall-to-wall -wall carpet. I had heard of it, but we never had that. And you could actually drink water from the tap. I was so happy for that one. And I think it even had a phone. So, the passage when Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you makes sense because I know what that's like and I know that's going to be an amazing place and I know I'll be with my father when we know God we don't have to have doubts about what's going to happen somehow things are going to work out and we need to be people others can trust that shows them this is who God is. My dad did that for me. And he says, you know what? We live here because of God. We do this because of God. We worship because of God. And we do all of this. And maybe it's bottom line survival, but it's because of God. And I realize a lot of you are going to have a lot worse stories than this. And I'm not trying to tell it so that it's the worst story. I'm trying to tell it because that's where I learned faith. And I believe in things I can't see. And I believe in that relationship of a son and a father. I believe things can be incredible there. All through this, I never thought anything was bad. I never thought any of it was bad. I just thought it was a problem to be solved. And I think that maybe that's the best way to look at life. It's not about how terrible things are and how much better it could be. It's just another problem to be solved until we finally get home. It's one of those incredible things. And we have a chance to show a world, a God like that, that he would do whatever it takes for us to live in a new place with him, even if it meant sacrificing his son. And his son has gone to make a place for you and for me. And he's coming back. We do have lots of trouble here. It isn't because of bad things, and it isn't because of him. He's the Savior. He brings us good things. Jesus is the author and perfecter of faith. And when we have faith, we get through all these bad things that the world throws at us because Satan is very much alive and active in the world. And God is going to bring us home to that beautiful place that he has prepared. I got to see that live. 
I want you to live that lie. I want you to realize God has made that place for you. If you're not already on that path today, I invite you to come. Be part of that. It's the most incredible ride. It's amazing what God does. Would you come while we stand and sing?